Hello, everybody. <laughs> it's 11.30, so I suggest we get, uh, we get started. Uh, so welcome. Uh, welcome also to everybody um, joining us uh, online. Uh, I heard we had a bigger crowd uh, online than in the room, which is always exciting, given that the IGF uh, is, a, is a hybrid uh, event. Uh, my name is Teresa Horeisova. I will be your moderator for today's session, uh, and I'm with the Global Forum on uh, Cyber Expertise. Uh, and joining me uh, in speaker capacity today uh, is uh, uh, Pua Hunter uh, from the Cook Islands, who is joining us online. Uh, hello and good afternoon to you. Uh, then uh, we have uh, here in the room uh, Liesl Franz uh, from the U.S. Uh, government, thank you, and Christopher Painter uh, from, uh, from the GFC, uh, the president of the GFC uh, Foundation. Uh, my helper uh, online uh, for the remote moderation is Alan uh, Tsabanlong, uh, also uh, from, uh, from the GFC, the director of our Southeast Asia Hub. What we will try to do at this session uh, is to actually mostly have a conversation with you. Uh, we will have a few um, you know, points to get us started, connected to the presentation of a, I hope, major conference that the GFC with its partners uh, is organizing at the end of uh, November uh, in Ghana, the so-called GC3B, uh, the Global Conference on Cyber uh, Capacity Building. Uh, but uh, we will particularly focus on uh, one of the outcome documents uh, that we expect will be coming uh, from this conference, so-called ACRA call, uh, which should set some, let's say, uh, uh, guidelines and ideas uh, for more efficient global action on cyber capacity building. And we would like to use your perspectives uh, to help us uh, shape uh, what this document uh, could, uh, uh, could look like. So I hope that this sounds as a, as a good plan. Uh, what uh, I suggest uh, that we do uh, for a start uh, is that uh, we will play a very short video <laughs> that, uh, that should introduce the conference a little bit and, uh, and then we go to the various speakers. So now fingers crossed that everything works and if I may ask uh, our dear colleagues here in the room uh, to, um, uh, to get Alan um, on screen uh, who will share his screen and play the video. Thank you very much. At this moment, it's without sound. Uh, Alan, can you stop it for a sec? I don't know if the sound issue is something we can handle in the room or on Alan's end. It also comes with digital Alan, risks. Alan, can we you all start need to again? be aware of those risks. No, he can't hear us. Sorry about that. Thank you. We can hear the sound now. And apologies for the technical glitch. The digital world touches every aspect of our lives. It enables us to connect, work, learn, and travel and plays an important role in safeguarding life essentials, such as food, water, and healthcare. Along with huge opportunities, it also comes with digital risks. We all need to be aware of those risks. To ensure a free, open, and secure cyberspace, every country should have the resources, knowledge, and skills they need to invest in their digital future. To this end, nations should work together and support each other with these capabilities so that every country can keep up with the digital transformation. After all, a chain is only as strong as the weakest link. On 29th to 30th of November 2023, the first global conference on cyber capacity building takes place in Accra, Ghana. Co-organized by the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, the World Bank, the Cyber Peace Institute, and the World Economic Forum, and hosted by the government of Ghana. This conference will be attended by decision makers from all over the world, high level government leaders and practitioners, the development community, experts on cybersecurity and capacity building, the private sector, international organizations, academia from all regions and across all sectors. They will gather to acknowledge that it is paramount for all nations to have the expertise, knowledge and skills to strengthen their cyber resilience and to work together on developing these capabilities to ensure a free, open and secure digital world. 
We must all act now on cyber capacity building because it is a key enabler for sustainable development, economic growth, and social progress. To this end, at the GC3B, the APRA call will be announced, a global framework for concrete actions that support countries in strengthening their cyber resilience. Stay tuned to the GC3B 2023. Thank you very much, Alan, for, for playing the video. Um, and um, I hope this serves as a little bit of uh, an introduction on uh, what we are up to. But uh, Liesl, if you could tell us more about um, uh, why, at first place, it's also important for the US government uh, to be, uh, be involved in these efforts, and uh, why you think the GC3B uh, is tackling some issues that are missing on the agenda. Great. Thank you, Teresa, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Liesl Franz with the State Department in the Bureau of Cyberspace and Digital Policy, and I am responsible for our International Cyberspace Security uh, Unit. And one of the key elements, one of our business lines, as I have come to describe it, is on international engagement and capacity building. Um, and it builds upon years of um, efforts in building capacity uh, around the world in various ways, including um, helping countries with national strategies, learning from our uh, experience, perhaps mistakes, <laughs> um, and also with uh, building incident response teams um, and other, uh, other efforts that uh, help build institutions in other countries to address um, the risks that you heard about in the video. Um, over the years, fortunately, we've been able to garner uh, a little bit more um, funding to provide uh, uh, capacity building around the world. Um, we started with you know, sort of one person doing cyber, cyber issues and capacity building years and years ago, and uh, we have uh, been able to build that out into a little bit more of activity. But what we found, first of all, is that um, there's you know, an increasing amount of demand for not um, only funds, but also the breadth of things that countries um, are looking for to be able to uh, build up their own resources, knowledge, and skills. And, um, and other countries were also uh, looking for ways to help provide such um, cyber capacity building. And I think as Chris has said in another session where he talked about the global cyber capacity building, we wanted to make, we want to make sure that all the countries that have the means to provide resources or funding are not doing all the same thing for, you know, the same people <laughs> around the world that we are able to spread the, uh, uh, spread ourselves across uh, the globe in a more coordinated fashion, or at least uh, informed fashion. Um, so that is why we were be, uh, supporters of the GFCE, the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, in, uh, in the beginning, um, and why we are supporting uh, the conference. Um, because we, th uh, you know, think it's a unique opportunity for the multi-stakeholder community and donor countries. This sort of uh, coordinated fashion recipients implementers, you know, those who are actually on the ground doing the capacity building that we and others can fund, the private sector and academia to um, actually have discussions and uh, dialogue to discuss the current state of cyber capacity building. What does it look like? Where is it happening? What are we providing to whom? And what is what are the demands that are coming from the global community? And so this comes at a critical moment when conversations at various multilateral organizations, such as the UN, say, <laughs> Um, or the International Telecommunication Union or others look to cover capacity building in greater detail because of that growing demand. So the, as you've probably heard, um, the year's this year's conference, um, inaugural, right? <laughs> uh, conference is thematically focused on um, bridging the gap between cy uh, cyber capacity building and digital, d digital development, and I would say maybe development writ large also, because um, it's not its own, it doesn't have to be its own thing. 
Um, but it's a uni unique opportunity to connect various groups and ideas that have um, too often been siloed and not, um, Chris used to talk about silos of excellence in the US government, fair point. <laughs> um, um, but uh, we see them in, uh, in sort of every aspect of the world and we wanna build those, uh, the connectivity between them. So how do we make progress on connectivity without sacrificing security? How do we digitize societies but also make sure that they are resilient? And these critical questions, and these are critical questions for us in the 21st century. We've heard them throughout the week here, and I think probably in our everyday <laughs> work lives. And I think um, all of you here and online understand that covering them, them in detail is important and worthwhile. So for these reasons, and probably many others, um, the US is looking uh, forward to participating through um, a high-level interagency delegation led by Ambassador Fick, or Ambassador for Cyberspace and Digital Policy, and engage the multi-stakeholder stakeholder community on these questions and probably many more that will come to the floor <laughs> in the conference. So we hope to see many of you in Ghana as well and um, so that we can take meaningful steps toward a safer digital and cyber future. Thanks. So <clears throat> thank you very much, you know, for your remarks, but also for the support uh, of the uh, of the U.S. government and uh, kind of uh, uh, reconfirmed by uh, by the delegation that you are that you are sending to Accra. That's that's fantastic. Um, although this is uh, the conference is called a global conference. Uh, it does take place in Africa. It is true that the Africa region is of particular importance uh, to the GFC. It's also a region we, where we have kind of progressed most uh, uh, with um, uh, kind of the approach of regional agendas uh, to cyber capacity building. But uh, the main aim of the event is really like to connect the regional perspectives with the global uh, uh, discussions. So in this sense, uh, it will be very important that we get perspectives from various regions. Uh, and at this, this point, I would like to turn to you, uh, Pua, uh, from uh, joining us from the beautiful Cook Islands, uh, to tell us a little bit more about the, the perspectives of Pacific Island states uh, when it comes to cyber capacity building and how you see um, uh, the regional efforts feeding into the global action. Uh, I hope we have you online and we can hear and see you. Let's give it a few seconds. Hi, Teresa, can you hear me? We can both hear you and see you. It's perfect. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, greetings, everyone. Um, so uh, there's actually a lot happening in the Pacific um, in the cyber ecosystem and cyber capacity building um, space. Um, in my view, this is a good sign um, because it demonstrates that um, nationally um, countries in the Pacific region are developing their own uh, enabling environment, their infrastructure, their legal framework, uh, their policies and plans, uh, including their capability and capacity to, to deal with developments in the cyberspace. And we do receive support uh, from our development partners, such as the World Bank, Asia Development Bank, United Nations Development Program, and so forth, um, which is a great thing. And, and we're very grateful. Um, we also benefit from the initiatives of uh, uh, regional and international organizations who deliver cybersecurity initiatives in our region. Uh, and for example, the Pacific Cybersecurity Operational Network, PAXON, the Pacific Islands Law Offices Network, uh, PILON, the Cyber Safety Pacifica, the E-Safety Commissioner, the Oceania Cyber Security Center, OCSC. And just recently, last week actually, um, in uh, Nandi, um, at GFCE, the Global Forum for Cyber Expertise, launched its uh, Pacific Hub and um, it was a great event. And this, more, um, many more regional and international uh, organizations are helping us here uh, in the region, in the Pacific region. So it's actually a busy, busy space, a good busy space. And these are useful uh, initiatives, um, undertakings and training offers extended to our region. Um, however, I, I think we need to be able to manage these events, both nationally and regionally, so we can better uh, reap uh, the benefit that these initiatives are intended for. It's one thing to, to bring something to the ground and then uh, leave and nothing moves from there. So, um, 
yeah, it, 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 it needs to be managed properly. Um, back in 2020, the Oceania Cybersecurity Center hosted the uh, Global Cybersecurity Capacity Building Conference. Uh, it focused on national approaches uh, to cybersecurity and also engagements in the region and with the development partners. The takeaway for me from that conference um, was contextualizing nationally and regionally through uh, more collaboration and engagement and also better coordination. And just last week, I attended the Pacific Cyber Capacity Building and Coordination Conference, the P4C in Nandi uh, in Fiji. Um, the same message about collaboration and uh, coordination was also repeated several times, um, but this time, um, you know, accountable was also attached to this, and I think that's a very powerful message. Uh, we need to be accountable for what we're doing in the cyber ecosystem. For me, uh, this also um, this message confirms that uh, cybersecurity is our own individual responsibility as well as our responsibility collectively. So, despite cybersecurity and cyber capacity building being um, a busy space in a region. Um, I think it's highlighting that cybersecurity is a very important component of our digital engagement that cuts across all sectors and across all the dimensions of cyber activities. Uh, we've seen that in the, the CMM review that OCSC did for uh, some of the countries here in, in the region, including us, the Cook Islands. I'm actually um, uh, encouraged that uh, at the highest level in the region, our leaders recognize and place emphasis on the importance of cybersecurity and references in the region's uh, high-level plans, the BOE Declaration, the 2050 uh, Blue Pacific Strategy, and recently um, the Langatoi, um, the endorsed Langatoi Declaration. Uh, next month, uh, the Pacific Islands Forum leaders uh, will be meeting here in the Cook Islands from the 6th to the 10th of November. And in their program, I was so um, happy to see that they've got a session for strengthening cybersecurity arrangements. Um, you know, again, it actually demonstrates the commitment of the Pacific leaders and uh, leading up to the upcoming GC3B in Ghana, it sets a clear path for the region and, and also the fact that uh, we've, um, we're looking at uh, high level uh, participation from our region. Uh, thank you so much. Well, thank you <clears throat> very much. Uh, uh, good, good remarks there. Uh, and you know, I'm happy that you also um, kind of called for a bit more uh, action uh, for things to be <clears throat> moving. And that's what we are hoping uh, that uh, that the GC freebie will help with, uh, not only to make some concrete progress on bringing the two rather siloed community uh, communities of development uh, and cyber together, but also to bring more political attention uh, to the very urgent issue of cyber capacity building, uh, uh, as Liesel, uh, Liesel stressed, but then have a kind of a tangible document, uh, you know, as, a, as an outcome that hopefully can, uh, can contribute to more concrete actions in the future. So, Chris, if I can turn to you, uh, the document's working title is the ACRA. <laughs> uh, but uh, would you be able to tell us a little bit more about the document in the shaping that will then be basis for the discussions and inputs that we will hopefully hear from all of you here? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, certainly, Teresa. And, uh, and just building off the prior comments to give a little context, um, we, we just launched the Pacific Hub. What the GFC does is it tries to do this exact coordination. So as Pua said, <laughs> and I saw this in Melbourne at the conference, we, uh, we, we helped uh, have a, a session uh, just before the pandemic, many of the island countries are saying we get lots of offers for help, but sometimes they're the same offers for help, and sometimes uh, we can't actually deal with them. And so one of the, the reasons for being of the GFC is to take donors and implementers and recipients and try to make more sense out of this, given we don't have a lot of resources. And that really builds on another thing that, that was mentioned, which is the overall purpose of this conference uh, is to, as Teresa said, to highlight and to promote this idea of cyber capacity building, which is often lost uh, as important as it is, but also to bring these uh, often disparate communities that don't talk to each other very well, the uh, cyber security capacity building com uh, community, which you know we know very well, 
but the traditional development community. Um, and the traditional development community not just does digital development, but, as, but indeed uh, development projects around the world. And if you think about the, the SDGs, or you, you know, if you think about those, almost all of them are undergirded by both digital and having strong cybersecurity. If you think about development projects like uh, water and power, and we saw this in the video, um, you know, they're often controlled by cyber means, and therefore cybersecurity is a foundational thing, but the communities don't really interact that much. So one of the big outcomes from this is to really promote that integration between these two communities and dialogue and actually leveraging each other's efforts. Uh, if we could go to the, uh, just move to slide five. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so, you know, obviously bringing people together, having those conversations, having that program is gonna be important, but even more important is this is meant to be a process and a, a call for future action. Uh, as Pua said, it's great to have all these like, oh, let's do this, but it's not that great if you actually don't have the actions to follow it. So the, the ACRA call, which is the working title right now, uh, instead of a declaration, declarations are like, we declare this, you know, but the call is a call for action, uh, much like the Christchurch call or the Paris call or some of the other ones that are out there, meant to be uh, sort of a living document. And the idea is really to elevate a mainstream cyber resilience uh, and in, uh, in the uh, development agenda and vice versa with actionable items. So going to the next slide. Okay, so that, that oh, here. <laughs> um, so it's meant to be an action framework drawing on, uh, from existing commitments, uh, but also some new commitments in, in a, a few different areas and really a blueprint for motivation and work in this area for both the development and the cyber communities. And I, I should be c uh, clear, it's not that, you know, the, we're not saying the development community has to understand cyber and the cyber community doesn't have to understand development. We both have to understand and work with each other. I think that both communities have been a little with blinders on. Now there are exceptions, the World Bank, uh, USAID, uh, the British Development Organization, a number of them are doing more of this, and I think that's good, but it's still kind of in its infancy. So it's gonna, this is a, a blueprint and call to action with the aim to elevate cyber resilience, and you may wonder why we use cyber resilience. Well, not surprisingly, when you say cybersecurity, the development community says, oh, that's a military thing, that's a security thing, why, why are we dealing with this? Cyber resilience, uh, it really resonates with both communities, both the cyber community and the uh, development community. And I think it, and it's really what our overall goal is, resilience. So uh, it's to elevate that, promote capacity building that supports larger development goals. Go to the next slide. Uh, so, and I should say that this uh, document is still in development. We hope to um, uh, uh, circulate a, a somewhat mature draft uh, at the end of October uh, for comment, for community comment, uh, and you know, welcome your comments then. But today we wanna kinda give you the conceptual framework and get some thoughts from you. Um, we think it matters now, as Teresa said, because we're at an inflection point. We're at this point where these development projects are getting more uh, dependent on cyber technologies and digital technologies. Uh, and we really need, we can't afford any longer to be in these separate communities. We can't afford in terms of resources to do that either. There's lots of resources in development. There's not that many in, in cyber capacity building, but we make each other stronger by working together. Uh, and it's, it's meant, the call is, me is directed to uh, countries, uh, including recipient countries, donor countries, um, uh, regional organizations, private sector, technical community, uh, really the entire multi-stakeholder framework that we know and love so well here at IGF. Uh, next slide. Um, yeah, I, I basically covered this. It's, it's, uh, the framework is really meant to uh, be uh, more of a call to action with specific items that will be listed under four major categories. Um, it's voluntary, uh, like most, most calls are. You can't, make, you can't really reach a binding agreement, as I think any of you know, in a short period of time, but a voluntary call where people um, sign on or endorse, I think it's very helpful. So it's, a, it's a not formal signatories, but people who endorse it. Go to the next. Okay, and I mentioned these four major areas, which will have ver various um, thoughts or action items under, and the four areas are 
One, uh, actions to strengthen the role of cyber resilience as an enabler for sustainable development. So that's exactly what I was covering, that drawing this connection in very clear terms and making uh, recommendations within that, uh, that bucket in terms of how the development community and the cyber community can work and leverage each other. The second major bucket is actions to advance demand-driven, effective, and sustainable cyber capacity building. These are things like making sure you have the political will in, uh, in countries to actually not just do one-off trainings, but that they really want this and you have more sustained capacity building. And that is demand-driven. You heard Pua talk about this as well, that we're simply not saying, here's a whole bunch of programs, but we're listening and talking to people in regions and in countries about what they want and what they need, and we're matching that. Because that, again, leads to sustainability and traction and something that our, heart, you know, our scarce resources are, are more effective by. The third bucket is to uh, foster stronger partnerships and better coordination. So the coordination is, again, one of the major elements here, and I mentioned this before. Uh, there ha you know, the whole reason we were set up is to promote coordination. There's much better coordination, I'll tell you now, than there was seven years ago. Still not perfect, you won't be surprised. Mm -hmm. but, but there's a lot. I mean, countries are talking to each other. Don donors are talking to each other. The platform we create has allowed a lot of this to happen. It's also happening organically in, in other venues, too, and that's great. But we need to amp up that coordination because, again, if we don't do that, we're, we're wasting the resources. We're not actually meeting the needs of the, of the countries and the others who need this help. Um, and then finally, uh, the last bucket is, uh, you know, one that everyone understands, which is resources. Uh, you know, how can we significantly up the game in terms of resource commitments to this area? You know, much like the, you know, no one has enough money. We all understand that. No one have, has enough people to do these issues. But uh, I think the SDGs have been very successful in focusing political attention and getting some resources. And I think there's been a lot of resources devoted to those. And we're not trying to, you know, as they say, rob Peter, Peter to pay Paul. We're trying to leverage each other's resources. This is not like give it to us and not to them. This is using the resources in order to, to achieve the things that the SDGs are trying to do, the development community is trying to do, that we see with the same vision of how this is done. And, uh, and it also allows us to learn from each other in terms of implementation modules. So those are the four major buckets, and we, we'd love to get uh, input from you in those. Um, it's uh, it's, um, it's going to be based on the conference in terms of, you know, those four buckets kind of were reflected in the agenda for the conference. But the content of the declaration or the, the call is meant to actually be actions after the conference. So the conference is a set piece, but it's really the process I talked about. And I mentioned the consultation. Uh, we started with a small group of, of, uh, of uh, co-organizers, us, the GFC, the World Bank, uh, the Cyber Peace Institute, and, and, um, and the World Economic Forum. Uh, other people who have been on the steering committee who have helped fund uh, the conference larger group of friends in the community, and we're in that process now, and that's one of the reasons we're here today. Um, so I don't need to go through all these. The public consultations, we're here. We're doing one now. We're going to do one at the Paris Peace Forum. We're going to do one in Singapore Cyber Week next week. Uh, any, any possibility we have, any chance we have to engage with the community, we're going to take. Uh, and as I say, we're going to circulate a mature draft, but certainly uh, willing to take uh, uh, input. So the question we have for all of you, um, is really those four buckets that I talked about. Um, does that cover everything? We think it does, but that doesn't, we, you know, we don't know everything, and the people who we're working on don't know everything, so we want input from you. Does that, those four broad buckets cover, I think, the major concerns we're talking about? And are there particular barriers uh, that we need to under, uh, overcome in better connecting cyber capacity building with development goals? Uh, and elevating the role of cyber resilience in, in development and vice versa that would lend themselves to particular action items that you would like to uh, talk about today. And, and also, this is an ongoing thing. If you leave this room and say, oh, I should have mentioned this, let us know. I mean, we want to hear about it. So that's really the setup for what we're trying to do today. We really like to hear from you uh, about where um, you think there could be progress made on this, about the overall idea, and about this kind of structure and if this makes sense.
Thank you very much, Chris. I think uh, that was quite clear. And now really is the time that we want to hear from you. Uh, you come from different backgrounds, different perspectives. Uh, you might have maybe come across some complications stemming from the fact that the uh, cyber and development communities don't interact with each other. You might have been uh, involved in various cyber capacity building projects. So uh, I would suggest, Alan, that we actually keep the uh, slide with the, with the four areas up. And uh, at this point, really, I would like to encourage you uh, to share your views with us, uh, either online uh, or here in the room. And, and don't be shy. We really yes. want your views. And I know there are a few people in the room who are not shy. <laughs> no, Michael, you will disappoint us if you don't. <laughs> Maybe ask you, but okay, we need to get you on the microphone. Oh, no, no, hold on, hold on. Otherwise, the online won't hear you. Either take this one or, or go there. But let me give you this one. Mike Nelson with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and I've worked with these people. <laughs> uh, really simple question: Why Ghana? What, what, what was the and, and what were the other things considered? Uh, and well will it, how much of it will be virtual? It, I mean, you don't have to be there to be part of it, right? Yeah, I think we're, we're trying to, uh, you know, uh, work on connection details so there'll be, you know, good virtual uh, ability. But I, I'd say it's sort of a long and storied history. I think originally we were hoping to have it uh, at the World Bank in Washington, uh, which also would have posed some challenges for people in visas and et cetera. Um, because of various COVID restrictions, other things, that wasn't going to work. And then we, we, we thought about a number of places, frankly. But uh, as Teresa said, you know, every region has unique needs. And, and we partner with the OAS in the Americas region. We, part, we have a, a Pacific Hub we just launched. We have a, um, a, li a ASEAN liaison. We're doing a lot of work in Africa. Uh, and uh, the government of Ghana very much wanted to do this. And uh, given... Uh, all the work that we've been doing in Africa, setting up an African uh, experts group, et cetera, it seemed like, you know, an important place to have. And it also was important, I think, to have the first one somewhere in the global south. You know, I think that that was an important thing rather than have it and, you know, there's lots of nice you know, places in the north you can have it, but it doesn't really send the right message. You know, it's a, then it's like a conference of the global north talking about what they're going to do, where this really needs to be a conversation. So that was really the, the rationale. Thank you. And we're quite happy about that, too. <laughs> yes, we are, and very grateful to now the that, you know, We want to get this one under our belt, but in the future ones, we'll have to figure out where the next one will be like. These things always work, but we want them to be representative, and so we certainly want to get people from all over the world. As I said, this is in Africa, but it's not a, just an African conference. Oh, thank you very much, Chris, also for the question. Others, please, including hopefully even on the substance of the, of the document in the making. Um, any takers? Please. Uh, Please yeah. go ahead, Sparky. Thank you. And uh, yes, if you can also introduce yourself and your institutional affiliation. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sparky yeah. from. <laughs> yeah, uh, Sparky from JP Said. Um, thank you for uh, your presentation. Uh, my, my question is, uh, obviously, what is what what are, what are written on uh, Accra Decra Accra call cannot be achieved like six months or two years. It has it should have um, you know uh, it, it may take more than a few years to uh, you know to reach the level uh, you, you like to you like to achieve. So my question is, other than you know your short time goal launching the call maybe after a few months, is there any plan for like year after or maybe goal your goal within next three years? Yeah, so uh, that's why I said for each of these categories, the idea is to have several more specific goals. And uh, although they're not going to have, uh, I don't envision them having strict time frames saying this is going to be done in like 90 days or uh, something like that. Um, we are going to monitor them. We're going to look at them, you know, after six months, after a year, see what progress is being made. Uh, when there is a second one of these conferences, as we said, this is the inaugural one. Uh, that's also a stock taking, but there's lots of opportunities for stock taking. And very much the idea of a call, is un unlike a more general declaration, is to make sure we're making progress. You know, not, we don't just want we don't uh, want this to become shelfware, as many things become, and then you never look at it again. So that's a thought process. Now, you know, um, 
people are going to make progress at different rates. Uh, in different parts of the community will implement them in different ways. That's why it's voluntary. Uh, but we we want to track and even go back to the parties who you know who support these efforts and say, okay, well, what have you done? You know, and not in an accusatory way, like, but in a way that just says, hey, can can are we making progress? Thank you, Sparky. Thank you, Chris. Others, Lisa, yes. Um, um, I, yeah, <laughs> stereo. Um, I think. Uh, uh, well, first of all, I would say um, that th I think the U.S. government has had some input into, uh, as part of the concentric circles that Chris was talking about, as far as the uh, consultation about the conference and uh, the the substance of the call. Um, so. I'll say this in my capacity, um, uh, and not not uh, um, necessarily prejudge or or discuss any of the other, or uh, undermine anything we've said into into the process so far. But one of the things that I think comes under the the action B, the second bucket on effective capacity building, is. Um, looking at the, the ability for any particular country to absorb a certain amount of capacity building um, at any given time. Um, do they have the, the institution before you, you know, before they get a deluge of, uh, of funding for something that's sort of amorphous or doesn't quite fit the need? Uh, so demand driven, but also, um, um, Tailored enough to the to the recipient so that it can be effective and I think also sustainable. The other thing that um, we have been grappling with is that, uh, to Sparky's point, I think about um, the fact that foreign assistance and capacity building is is often a long term in investment over time and takes time to uh, for the the knowledge skills and. Um, uh, institutions to develop before they can um, have the full impact that you want. Um, but we have been grappling with more uh, emergent or urgent response in some of the uh, uh, crises, I suppose, for lack of a better word, that we've seen in Ukraine and Albania and Costa Rica. And so there might be, um, that might be an element of effective as well in the second bucket, al although I would also think it could be captured in the third bucket as far as partnerships and uh, coordination. Of course, every I think everything uh, re relies on D, which is the financial resources, but um, even if those aren't in, you know, in text in the Accra call, I think those are two things that we um, in the United States are looking at when we're looking at these days as far as our strategic approach, our strategic outlook for some of the, um, some of the capacity building that we're trying to do now. Thanks, Liesl. <coughs> Thanks, Liesl. <laughs> <laughs> all I'm all choked up, I'm all choked up. Uh, others, please, online too, if it, people have comments. Yes, please go ahead, yes. Okay, my name's Casey Rout in Das France is actually my boss, so I'll pose this to Chris so I don't put her on the hot seat. But uh, we had a com <laughs> <laughs> we had a conversation yesterday, and I've been kind of thinking about this a little bit more, and it, it goes into B of sustainable cyber capacity building. And so after the donors and trainers leave, you know, the countries need budgetary resources to continue, you know, the hardware, the software, the knowledge, the training. So how do we work, what's your view on involving legislators in training them, having them understand the value of this so that they create the budgetary resources we need to really have sustainable capacity with cybersecurity and governments? And how do we better integrate them, whether it be through GC3B or, or other ways? Yeah, look, I, th I think that's a, a big issue. Uh, and that goes to the political will and the sustainability uh, point. So, you know, there are two aspects of that. One is getting the country buy-in at a legislative and leadership level. And I agree that maybe those are some things we can work into this. Another is, you know, under that last bucket, 
uh, unlocking the financial resources. You know, there are a lot of financial streams that are available and used in the development community, and there are models the development community uses to measure sustainability, to make sure that their dollars and pounds and pesos and other things are, the end, uh, are actually well spent, and, and it's, you know, not just one off. So I think there's a lot we can learn from the development community, too, in terms of the tools they use. So, one, for, for example, one of the things that we're... Um, uh, thinking of having as one of those action items is to identify and employ the full range of financial streams available for financing of national cyber resilience activities, including international development financing, domestic resource mobilization, which really goes to your point, uh, private sector, incorporation of cyber resilience and integrated national financing frameworks, and that's exactly your point, I think. So it's not just an add-on or like some boutique little bubble over here, it's actually part of the larger plan. So I think that's, that's the kind of wording we're thinking about now, but I think that helps uh, put that into some relief. So thanks for that. And I'm really glad that we are talking about the you know, practicalities connected to budgets uh, and money, because also, as Chris pointed out, I mean, no one has enough uh, money, budget. Uh, no if one you could all leave a check on the way out, that would be uh, <laughs> helpful. <laughs> no one has uh, enough people. Mike, just, you, you just leave your, your credit card and, the, uh, you know, and your pin, and we'll be fine. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's why it's uh, you know a little bit um, uh, also you know makes the situation inefficient, you know, and we should uh, make sure uh, that the resources are used efficiently, which uh, wouldn't be necessarily happening, you know, if we if we do not connect uh, these two communities, but also if we do not connect more on kind of coordinating uh, cyber capacity, building support globally, which is kind of the main <laughs> you know raison d'être of the uh, of the of the GFC. Um, I well, because we do have a speaker online, and because she is online, <laughs> I don't want to kind of put her in the in the shadow. So Pua, please give us a sign uh, if you wanna uh, chip in. Uh, otherwise, we will uh, continue the discussion in the room. And I also know we have uh, okay. So uh, yes, no, sorry. Uh, I know we have one uh, one comment uh, online uh, from uh, from Alan. Uh, on Southeast Asia, so please go ahead now. Okay, we cannot hear you. Hello, good morning, can you yes, hear me please. now? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, and maybe let's remove the slides so that we can see you uh, properly, Alan, thank you. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, yes, uh, the GC3B uh, conference on capacity, cyber capacity building. This will inspire other regions um, and live with a renewed commitment for global cybersecurity cooperation. So it, it, uh, it's very important for the Southeast Asia, not just the, the Pacific as well, and other regions, so that uh, they will be inspired to globally engage with other regions as to um, capacity building efforts and share insights and ideas and good practices in, uh, that they can learn in the GCTP. And uh, I would also take this opportunity to invite everyone uh, next week no, in the GFC regional meeting uh, in Singapore uh, during the Singapore Internal Cyber Week. And this will be again discussed there um, during uh, this, uh, and, uh, I, I mean, next week. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Alan. And you know, if any of you are traveling to Singapore for the Singapore International Cyber Week, please uh, let us know. You know, so that we make sure uh, that you're also part of the uh, part of the conversation. Uh, any other reflections, either uh, online or here in the room, please? Please go ahead. Hello, everyone. <coughs> Sorry. My name is uh, Guus van Zwol, and I'm uh, with the Dutch government, and we are very supportive, of course, of the GFCE. They're run by our colleagues at the same team. Um, <coughs> we recently, as the Netherlands, um, have published our new international cyber strategy, where we also lay a big layer, a foundation of our strategy is cyber capacity building. But we do tie it in it to also supporting countries that are receiving the cyber support to also adapt their regulatory frameworks in order that to make sure that these cyber capacities are being 
run in a framework that's uh, with respect for, your, uh, for rule of law, um, international human rights standards. And I was wondering what your perspective on that would be and if that would also be a part of the GC3B conference. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think you know there's there are parts of any kind of um, a declaration or call, and one of them is sort of the preamble that sets it out. And certainly, uh, respect for human rights, and you know, uh, we don't get really get into the regulatory framework as much, but rule of law, yes. Uh, and then the action items are more, uh, I think, more tailored to other things. Although there's some of that mentioned there too, but that that is certainly a goal. We want to integrate that, you know, better governance. Uh, and respect for human rights, and this is like foundational to the to the GFC certainly too, uh, going forward as we do this, and that's indeed what the development community does too. So that's another where place where there's a good nexus, I think. Thank you. Also, and Teresa, if you have thoughts, or, or Pua, if you have thoughts, or and Pua Al has yeah. thoughts actually. So okay. Pua has thoughts. So uh, a All second right. <laughs> <laughs> second attempt uh, to connect you, Pua, please. Thank you, uh, Teresa. <coughs> Sorry. Um, I actually wanted just to, to circle back to um, the comment uh, earlier on from one of um, our um, participants here about uh, the sustainability. Uh, so right, you know, uh, sometimes when, you know, our donors come and assist us with something and then um, um, they leave. And, and there's no continuity. We need to, to look at how we can resource ourselves properly so uh, there's sustainability attached to it. Um, also, um, from our uh, the meeting last week in Nandi, uh, participants were talking about um, these trainers coming into the country, into the country, so that there's more of us to be trained at one given time rather than one person going to a regional or you know somewhere where the trainer is able to train many countries, but one or two from each country. Um, so the idea is to, to bring the expertise and train more on the ground rather than one or two going out to, to be trained. Because the other um, issue with that is the, the, the knowledge learned from uh, these um, uh, trainings overseas may not be transferred back or appropriately transferred back uh, in country. So uh, again, those needs to be uh, looked at uh, appropriately. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pua. That's a very concrete uh, suggestion there. Uh, any uh, other reflections, comments? Chris, I, I, I should say that, you know, uh, I totally agree with that and we've seen that. So, you know, I'm not sure which, that it fits under several buckets, but one place that we're trying to reflect that now is under the third bucket of fostering stronger partnerships and better coordination. And one of the things we're thinking of under that is a bullet or something that would say fostering uh, the leadership of developing countries and coordinating CCB efforts in close cooperation with donors and others. So it's not it's more locally owned as well. And I completely agree that just having a whole be group of people descend on the country and then leave again doesn't actually help in the long term. So you do want to have, uh, you know, there's another part in, in the last bucket where we talk about systemizing south-south and triangular cooperation. So again, it's not just you know, a whole bunch of people landing on your shores and then leaving again, but really kind of building this in more more permanently. Kind of the train the trainers yeah. uh, logics in that. No, thank you very much, Chris. Any other reflections? Please go ahead. Thank you. Hi, Linda Mazels from the State Department. So I'm interested in deconflicting between donor countries and how we can use the GC3B and GFCE as a mechanism for doing that, that would also involve not reinventing the wheel. So if there are tools that already exist that there's no reason to do them again, uh, how do we find them? How do we, pr for instance, use an existing tool like the Sybil Portal to make sure that we are not doing the same work over and over again? And how do we get donor countries to speak to each other? Thank you. Uh, and, and that's uh, the raison d'etre for why we were created is uh, for that very purpose. And indeed, when we were in the Pacific, uh, when we were launching the Pacific Hub, we had a sort of side meeting, which I guess we do every couple months of the donor countries there, of a core group of donor countries, which they found very, and this has you know, been at their request, so that they can share information with each other. Now, you know, it's never going to be perfect because countries have their own priorities, and that's the way the world works, and that's fine. But I think they welcome the ability to share that information to find out what someone else is doing, because sometimes it's like, well, we don't need to do that, or we can join your efforts, right? So, um, and we were not, we don't want the 
Acra call to create new giant new structures. You know that I think is not helpful. We we leverage the structures we have. Many of you know who've been following some of the debates in the OEWG. There's this debate: should we create a new, you know, ecosystem? Well, why would you do that with the scarce forces, resources you have when you need to leverage what's there? So, for instance, under the coordination, the third bucket, one of the things we specifically say is. Utilize existing coordinating nation platforms like ours, for instance, uh, to better coordinate and deconflict and have the kind of donor dialogue that you're talking about, uh, and strengthen them. You know, so make them more participatory, get more people involved in them. So I think that's what we're trying to do. You know, take what we have, make it stronger, and be more effective with the resources we have. Thank you very much, Chris. And maybe just to add, because Linda also mentioned the the Sybil portal. You know, it's available on sybilportal.org. And uh, it's um, kind of a resource where we try to map various cyber capacity building projects globally. It's possible to, uh, you know, filter on specific regions, specific country, uh, and you know, get the information on already implemented or currently in going ongoing projects. And why is that important? Because to be able uh, to plan, let's say, uh, a new <laughs> activity in a specific country it is kind of a good idea to build on what others have done so that there is, to the extent possible, a little bit less duplication uh, of efforts and uh, ultimately, again, uh, more efficient use of uh, the res limited resources available for these activities. Uh, any other comments or inputs? Susan, please. Susan Garoe from our Pacific Hub, please go ahead. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to also uh, to, uh, just uh, on uh, what Linda has uh, said uh, when it comes to the conflicting uh, um, interests when, uh, when it comes to donors. Uh, what we notice is that we're living in an era where collaborations and cooperations is a strength going forward. Going solo, an individual is not effective anymore. And there are many reasons to it. And, and in the Pacific, uh, uh, one of the things that uh, I noted is we are on different parts when it comes to cyber security. Some of us are more advanced. Some of us are just taking baby steps. And with this well-coordinated effort, we ensure that no one is left behind and we make use of all the resources that we have. So that, that's a, a plus on these types of, of platform. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Definitely a good, uh, good comment there. Um, if there are no other comments. So, uh, yes, Liesl and then Chris, yeah? Thanks, this uh, conversation has um, actually spurred a couple things for me that maybe to add to the uh, thought process go going forward. Um, one is that, you know, we talked about in the video and a lot of the conversations here have been about um, uh, the cybersecurity efforts to um, uh, to address the risks, um, and that there is a cost to doing to doing so. Um, but there's also, a, um, I think, many benefits to providing cybersecurity efforts in the um, processes and digitization and um, tra digital transformation efforts that countries are going through right now. And I think um, finding a way to emphasize the positive because you know, when we talk about funding or we talk about political will or we talk about, um, uh, um, okay, funding or polit political will, those are pretty important. Um, you know, sometimes it's hard to say, well, we've got, you know, we have to make this huge investment in cybersecurity for something may never happen. But I think perhaps changing some of that rhetoric to providing cybersecurity for the betterment of economies and digitization and, you know, investment in economy. That might be something to, to you know, if a development bank builds a bridge, it's a positive, right? So maybe thinking about what the analogy is there for cyber. Um, and then secondly, I really appreciated Pua's comment about um, uh, wanting to have the ability for uh, training uh, on in-country and on-site so that it is well integrated into the uh, whatever, asp whatever phase of development that that institution of the country uh, agency is in. Um, but I think perhaps we can also talk about um, 
the uh, various types of training or capacity building that can happen, maybe thinking about it and uh, stealing a page from uh, the legal community, continuous learning or continu continuing education so that there's a, you know, uh, uh, you know, sort of fundamentals and then things that will help uh, individuals, even if they have to go somewhere else to get it. Um, we know that not every, you know, cert, for example, can send all their people to a training and outside the country at any given time, but perhaps there are ways that individuals who have, who have, um, you know, been trained in country can then take advantage of continuous learning opportunities going forward. Anyway, that's just a reaction to a couple things that, uh, that uh, people have said here, and if it's I able to be captured, th and there's uh, uh, interest by others, then perhaps some way to think about it. Uh, so th thanks for that. There are a couple of things that, uh, you know, as I heard some of the comments, I just uh, like to know. First of all, we welcome your continued feedback. Okay. Does this structure make sense? Are we missing a whole? I don't think we are, but are we missing a whole group of things that we should be addressing? I think the comments I've heard would fit into those four buckets in some level. Um, you know, to the question was asked by our uh, Dutch colleague earlier, uh, one of the uh, proposed things we're thinking of putting under the second bucket is uh, professionalizing cyber capacity building community of practice with tools and guides to help stakeholders put into practice established principles, including human rights-based and gender-sensitive uh, approaches to CCB. So that is that is built into at least our, our thinking right now. It has to be put on paper and actually uh, kind of wordsmith and negotiated among folks. but. That's, that's certainly there. And, um, and also this idea of doing a better job of creating tools where we can measure the results. And that, you know, that's where the development community is pretty good. You know, they, uh, or at least I think they're pretty good. Uh, they, they have these tools where they measure the result of a project because that then helps them decide where they're going to invest. And, and the other thing they do well, which I think we need to figure out how to do, is to prioritize it. One way is to link it to critical national resources. Uh, you know, uh, big projects are going to make a big difference where cyber is going to be critically important. You know, figuring out how to prioritize too, I think will help too, and, and learning from each other on that. So those are some of the areas. But I'd say again, you know, again, we have a couple more minutes left. Do you have any input or things you, you think should be in there or thoughts? Uh, but also welcome input afterwards. So you have four minutes, right? Four minutes. So take advantage of it. Structure any one of these, any comment, any suggestion you'd like to see. And yes, it's before lunch, so I uh, we respect that. And anyway, it's time time to wrap. But um, uh, thank you very much, uh, you know, uh, Pua. Uh, Alan online uh, for your support, uh, Liesel and Chris here in the room, and in particular to all of you online and, um, and on site. Uh, to those of you here in the room on your way out, we have prepared some uh, more resources on GC Freebie and some goodies as well. So <laughs> you might take it um, home with you. And as this is the last day of the IGF, let me also wish you very safe travels back home uh, and see you around. Thank you very much. And, and I should uh, uh, thank you all for being here. Sh I, I should just uh, shout out to Teresa for uh, organizing this. And this, uh, Teresa has also been on the multi-stakeholder advisory group for the last several years, and she's rotating off that, so thank her for all her efforts in the IGF, too. <laughs>